All right, y'all, you're locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman. And today I am joined by Alan Stirk, a contributor over at the Falcoholic, who was on hand on Monday night uh, to cover the Falcons Jets preseason matchup. And we'll get his insights into that game as well as the latest cuts the Falcons have made. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Sirius Black. Been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at FalcFans.com, RIP, still going strong. On Twitter, at FalcFans, and the humble host of this world-renowned Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. And today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster, post your job, for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. And guys, we thank you for making Locked On Falcons your first listen each and every day. Of course, it's free and available on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify. Check us out also on YouTube. And if you hit that bell, you subscribe and you give us a like, you will get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio drops. So, guys, I'm here once again with the former co-host of the Locked On Falcons podcast, the former co-host of the Falk Fans podcast, also a current contributor over at the Falcoholic. He also is running things over at Odyssey, uh, so you can thank him for you know how smooth and, and how great 92.9 The Game and other Odyssey uh, <laughs> radio shows are running. But uh, I am once again joined by Alan Sterk. You know what, Aaron? Unfortunately, now that De Samaro doesn't have it, it's not just. I, I still, it still hurts his soul. Like I can't believe they're gone. But now that De Samaro are gone, it's good to know that I can at least depend on someone for a super long, entertaining intro. Yep. You know, in honor of De Samaro, I started doing AKAs. I haven't done it consistently, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll get to a point. You know, probably like six months where the AKAs will go for about ten minutes, just like De Samaro. Uh, yeah, you got like a Johnson Avenue line in there, Kel McGarry, you know, yeah, the, the the mayor of, of McGarry Island or, or whatever. We might be taking a visit to McGarry Island, uh, you know, later today. But uh, Alan, you were at the game. You were on hand. You were there, you know, asking Arthur Smith the, the hard hitting questions after the game, talking to the various players. But before we get into your insights from inside the locker room, what were your general thoughts on the Monday night's Falcons Jets game? It was it was a weird set of going to it because the Jets had 17 stars not play. And that immediately kind of sucked the life out of it a little bit. It's like, all right, how can we assess this game now? Because our dismissal all about competition. There's starting positions that still need to be earned. Meanwhile, Robert Sala is treating this like fourth week of preseason. So I, I don't want to have too many strong takes. But look, it, was, it was great to see the Falcons offense move the ball smoothly. A couple of big chunk plays. Ironically, to tight ends with Kyle Pitts and Anthony Ferkser. Uh, you could tell Arthur Smith was running a lot of 12 and 22 personnel, getting those two tight ends. I did not expect to see Parker Hesse on the field for that long, but he was out there. It was like Keith Smith and then a Parker Hesse. I'm like, all right, power football. Where's Aaron where you need him? But uh, yeah, it was, it, it was everything you kind of expected when it was the first team against the second team. You wanted to see the Falcons take control, and they did. Uh, I wish the pass rush made more plays, but you know, it's like Chris and overall pass protection held up relatively well. I'll talk about the first string, of course, because the second string that got dicey, but you know, you have to be encouraged. And I thought both quarterbacks showed great command and poise in the pocket. And you know, considering all the concern going to the crowd season's a whole other beast, but you have to be enthusiastic with Mariota and Ritter right now. Everything they've done in preseason just builds up encouragement. Yeah, uh, I made a mistake on yesterday's episode saying I didn't think Michael Clemens and Jermaine Johnson played. I didn't notice them playing, but that's a testament to uh, the play of the Falcons starting offensive line. So I probably didn't give them enough credit on yesterday's episode. Uh, the two sort of jet rookie 
phenom edge rushers. They they seem to take a little bit more advantage of the, the second team offensive line. But, you know, again, at this point in time, like we, we, we can't spend too much energy worrying about the second team offensive line when we're spending, you know, all the energy worrying about the starters. The left side, I, I want to preface that because I thought the right side, I thought Jermaine Defetti actually had a couple of more flashes. Okay. All right. Yeah. The yeah. left side the offensive line, though. The... Fair enough. So, um, you know, it was nice seeing this game. You know, one of the things about Arthur Smith and these sort of Shanahan derivative offenses is that they tend to carve up cover three. That's what they're really designed to do. And the Jets were basically playing classic Robert Sala, you know, from that uh, Pete Carroll, Dan Quinn coaching tree cover three. And they absolutely carved it up. So that's um, certainly a good thing to see. And as you say, like, you know, obviously you weren't getting the Jets best in this game, given how many players they were sitting. But you want to see when you're facing lesser competition, you want to see your better players dominate. And I think we saw that in the first half of the game. Yeah. And especially I thought the secondary really stood out as well. They were challenging a lot of passes. You didn't see too many. High percentage looks. I know Mike White, his ball placement was all over the place, but uh, the secondary, I think, kind of what you want to see because I just thought last year, like, the quarterbacks were throwing a lot of fun. I know, all right, second, third string, but, you know, someone like D. Alford, I think, you know, it wouldn't surprise you one bit if he got looks in dime packages this year. Like, I think who else could be the fourth corner right now? Yeah, I think it, it, it's going to be interesting because – it seems like Mike Ford and, and Darren Hall have been working ahead of him, but he seems to be pushing. And, you know, I think last week, a lot of last weekend's joint practices were giving Alford that opportunity to see what he can do with the starters. And from all indications at the joint practices and also on Monday night's game, he seems to be taking advantage of that. So we could be getting to a point where he is sort of that fourth corner uh, heading into um you know, the season uh, and is active each and every day. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll see if the Falcons deploy more dime this year, but uh, that was something I don't think they did really much of any last year, but obviously Dean P's, you know, talked a big game about not installing the entirety of the, the defense. And I know one of those years he was in Baltimore, they used a lot of dime. Uh, so we'll see if uh, he sort of expands things as part of the going from 60% install that he claimed was last year to hundred percent install that he expects to see this year. Yeah, I feel like by like week three, people are going to be posting that quote, the Falcons allow like 38 points. And like, All right, this is DMPs, 100% is defense. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll see what happens in the, in the season. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about which quarterback we might see uh, as the season approaches. Get Allen's thoughts on that since everybody seems to want to weigh in uh, and, and talk about this quarterback situation as if it's not as set in stone with Marcus Mariota being the starter. And we'll see what Alan thinks of that as we continue today's episode. Um, but guys, before we get there, you know, the Falcons are currently in the process of finding the right people to help their team this fall. And maybe you're in the process to find the right people for your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders this fall. And LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier for you to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach the world's largest professional network of over 800 million people. LinkedIn Jobs helps you spread the word that you're hiring and gives you simple tools like screening questions to make it easy to focus on the candidates with all the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. And did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? All you got to do is post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's LinkedIn dot com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. So guys, I want to thank you for making a locked on Falcons, your first listen each and every day, and make sure you check out the ultimate pro football preview starting August 31st. That's an eight episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season. And you'll find the local team experts on the locked on podcast network, as well as the odyssey NFL insiders all combining into one ultimate NFL preview starting August 31st. Search for the ultimate pro, pro football preview 2022 on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
So Allen, of course, as I mentioned earlier, was at the game, covering the game, getting the insights from the various players after the game, getting those you know great sound bites from Arthur Smith and others. He wrote an article uh, having talked to Kyle Pitts, Tyler Algier, and Alameda Zacchaeus after the game. Uh, you can go check out that article over at thefalcoholic.com right now. Um, but uh, Alan, were there sort of any things that those players said to you that stood out to you that you want to highlight for the listeners or some additional insights or context that you want to provide to some of those quotes that you got from those guys? I thoroughly enjoyed speaking to Alameda Zacchaeus. He is very insightful, like just about his mentality going into the season because he realized going to the league, he's a you know, five foot eight, kind of known as a burner, but he really wants to evolve. And he was talking about you know, taking the reps becoming more physical because Arthur Smith really emphasizes blocking. So he dived into that a little bit, talked about the coverage and why, you know, he saw the inside leverage, so he did an outside move, then he knew he had to win on top of the route. And then once he once he realized the pass protection held up as he was you know, crossing towards the end zone, he's like, all right, Mariota, he's going to place a route of money. So uh, I liked his little breakdown there. He was he was really cool to talk to. Uh, Tyler Algier, I interviewed in May, so – we, we kind of already got a bit of a relationship. He's su- super laid back, very humble. Like you can just tell he comes from a, a really uh, disciplined background. So uh, we spoke for a little bit. He was talking about how he's just – he's really dialed in on blitz pickups because it's something that he didn't really have – was too responsible for in BYU. So one of the biggest things that he even knows that, you know, as re- young running backs, like if you can't block, you're going to lose snaps. And he realizes, like, I need to pick up my game because Damian Williams is a good blitz pickup or uh, Cordell Patterson, uh, maybe not as much, but you know, Damian Williams is kind of that third down back. So he sees him as competition. So Algier, he's really, he's a film junkie too. He talks about how much he loves watching film. He's working with Mariota and Ritter. He's like, I want to get those reps as much as possible. And you kind of saw it against the Jets. They had him run an angle route. He was lining up in the slot a little bit. They were really featuring him. So I think he's really taking on this role where he's just, he wants to prove he's a complete back. He's not someone that's just this downhill runner that can play for a second down. He wants to be, you know, that all-purpose back. So I was really excited to talk to him because you know I interviewed him in May. But uh, and it was crazy. Like his right leg was like all bruised. Like he had like three ice packs on. He was looking like that picture of Ben Roethlisberger from years ago, where he has like ice packs everywhere. Yeah, he was pretty beat up, but he he. Uh, he was in uh, high spirits all things considered. And I thought he played very well. So I think, you know, he kind of realized this game really boosted his stock. Uh, Ritter was cool, but like Ritter, he was like on the move. He was talking about, we talked briefly about the pistol because you saw the Falcons had a couple of pistol looks. And he talked about the matchups that you know, they could exploit there and something that he has full comfort in. Uh, Kyle Pitts actually got aggravated with me. So I don't know if I want to talk much about Kyle Pitts because I was asking about, you know, What's his preference when it comes to lining up in the slot, outside, in line? And he essentially said, that's a question for Arthur Smith. And I don't know anything about that. So I think Kyle Pitts is just very much, it, it's business. Like, you know, he's here to do whatever helps the team win. He's the one to get too much of the technical stuff out there. Because, like, my whole philosophy is when it comes to interviewing players, I kind of want to try to ask of more of the technical side of the game, but also you are trying to see what, you know, they're trying to improve on or what they're using in preseason to – you know, enhance their skill set. So, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Kyle Pitts was uh, in no mood for it, but uh, Ritter, Algier, and Zacchaeus, all awesome interviews. Okay, well, I imagine Kyle Pitts' agent will care about where he lines up in two years when it comes to negotiating his contract. Right. But, uh, we'll see. We'll see about that. Um, he's like, you know, just. I won't answer those questions. Re- refer those to my agent. That's basically, I think, how he approached it. But uh, let's let's talk about you know the the quarterback uh, conversation. We we know that uh, Marcus Mariota is the week one starter, but you know, given how well Desmond Ritter has played these last couple of uh, preseason games, you know, there's a lot more talk that uh, you know maybe you know the Falcons should have a shorter leash on Mariota. Maybe the Falcons should consider. Throwing Ritter out there to the Wolves, you know, by the name, one of them named Aaron Donald, the behind me on the wall uh, that, you know, whoever's going to be the quarterback will be running from in week two. Um, what are your thoughts on that sort of conversation? I've, I've had a number of people come on and, and sort of be like, no, there's no quarterback controversy. But it seems like every single week with, uh, you know, the, the better Desmond Ritter plays, the more I think a lot of people, not only in Atlanta, but around the, the nation 
want to know why isn't there more of a quarterback controversy? I think Mario is the definitive star, but he should be on a bit of a shorter leash just of how good Ritter has looked. I've been really just impressed by it. Not just his composure and poise, but he just seems to, like, the anticipation that he throws with is just something that it's come across the first two games against Detroit and the Jets. Like, that throw to Ferks or across the middle, I feel like I really thought that was going to get picked off, but wow, the ball placement just impeccable. And it seems like he doesn't get too rattled. Like, yeah, he had the intentional grounding, which was kind of a miscommunication. And the Lions gave me through an interception, which is miscommunication. That's just something where, you know, those like kind of mental mistakes. And I know Arthur Smith kind of got on his case for the blunder in the red zone. But overall, though, like, you know, yeah, there is reason to be like persistent and wanting Ritter to start. Absolutely. But I just think, you know, Mariota hasn't damaged his stock. He knows this, you know, Arthur Smith, the familiarity is there. And, uh, look, I, I could tell you, like, he did his own press conference last night. Like, the Falcons are approaching the season as Mariota's going to be a starter. Like, you don't get your own press conference if you're not the starter. So, Mariota, he, he's locked in for a week one. There's no controversy there. But I definitely do think the lease should be you know, slightly shorter after what we've seen from Ritter because I think he looks ready. Like, I, I wouldn't see why not playing him. But I just think Mariota, what has he done to damage his stock? I think to me, Mariota, you know, one thing I've been really impressed about is because the big issue with me watching him from Tennessee, just his frustrating tendency of taking sacks and just not playing well under pressure. And I thought so far, we've seen, especially against the Lions, he handled the pressure well, and he's making the right decisions. So if he could do that, who knows? Maybe he could be on the field till November, December. Maybe. Maybe he'll be able to outrun Aaron Donald. I wouldn't want to test also, that. Aaron Donald, Donald. Like, come on, it's week two. The hate week is week one. Well, you know, we'll, we'll we'll get up for hate. Don't worry about it. I'm just saying, like, I don't have a poster of Cam Jordan on my post on my wall. That's all I'm saying. All, all this pit talk, man. You know, it's the greatest university in the history of the world. You know, we invented the polio vaccine. So, you know, I don't know what else you know we can do uh, to to save mankind in the 20th century. What do What do you think about this though? We'll, we'll get the people your take. I, I mean, look, you know, I know there's already some angry comments right now on this video about, you know, you know, you, no one wants Ritter, blah, 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 it's whatever. But like, for me, it's like, yeah, I think Mariota is the starter. I, you know, I, I don't think there's any sort of concern about that. The question, the thing I've basically been talking about since June on this podcast is like, the better Ritter plays, the shorter that leash gets. So basically echoing what you say that, you know, going in, you know, back in May was like, hey, you know. Mariota is going to be the guy for at least half the season, if not longer. Uh, and now it may be like, you know, if the Falcons don't get off to a, a good start this year, which I'm not currently expecting, despite, you know, how great they've looked in the preseason, um, you know, we might not see Mariota pass the first month of the season. So that's, a, I think, a legitimate conversation that is worth having. Um, but, you know, time will tell. I think so much of it depends on uh, how competitive this team is, how successful this team is with their wins early in the season. If they get off to a good start this year, they beat the Saints in week one, they can beat Seattle, they can beat Cleveland, all possibilities at this point in time, then, you know, I don't think anybody's going to be clamoring for Mariota uh, to lose his job anytime soon. But, you know, if they wind up dropping most, if not all of those games, again, kind of assuming that they'll drop the game to the, the Rams, then, you know, I think it's justified to kind of, you know, see what you have in the rookie at, at some point uh, sooner versus later. Yeah, and Arthur Smith, like, three-fourths of the press conference is talking about Ritter, and one of the biggest quotes I've tweeted this out is just he said that the reason I'm going to be so hard on him is because I'm not treating him like a rookie. He's too talented. Like, he really views him as a player that's ready to go. So I think in the back of his mind, Arthur Smith's like, yeah, I, I want to do this, but at the same time, Mariota, I think it's just from the familiarity and just I, I, this is going to be a bit of a rough season, so why not, like, smooth the process a little bit? But I think once the opportunity is there, I'm just going to put him in there because like, like I was not blown away, but it just, you can tell Arthur Smith gets excited to talk about Ritter. Like, even though he's, he's going a little bit hard and like, you, like his, his body language just shows like, okay, this is going to be my guy. Yeah. So um, those are our thoughts on the Falcons jets game. Maybe we'll have some additional thoughts uh, when we talk a little bit more about the most recent cuts, uh, we'll get Alan's thoughts on, you know, uh, Auden Tate and Geronimo Allison and, and Pitt legend Lafayette Pitts uh, getting 
uh, cut on Tuesday, as well as the potential uh, that the Falcons lost another defensive lineman uh, and whether or not they can shore up the depth there, as well as maybe some players that stood out to Allen on Monday night that he feels like have made the case beyond just D. Alford uh, to, to stick on this roster. And we'll get into all of that as we continue today's episode. But guys, before we get there, I got to plug the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family where you get three shows with four hosts breaking down not only local shows, but national sports headlines as A to Z with Mark Zeno hitting hard with uh, John Chuckery and ATL Day Ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanitra Batiste. Find them all on the same podcast feed wherever you get your podcast. And if you subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta, Atlanta on YouTube. You also be able to check out the Locked On Braves postcast, breaking down every Braves win and loss this year, as well as the Locked On Falcons postcast, where Jarvis and I are going live after each and every Falcon game, preseason, regular season, postseason, uh, to break down the latest on the Falcons. So subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube, and then uh, subscribe to it on wherever podcast platform you listen to. And guys, uh, the Falcons did not cover against the Jets. Uh, once again, we're back into the, the groove of things where I say, hey, um, take the Falcons in this game or don't take the Falcons. And the opposite comes true. It looked like, you know, going up to halftime, everything was looking great for the Falcons covering that two and a half point spread against the Jets. But then unfortunately, Felipe Franks uh, did, was not able to continue the momentum, which is why I know so many of you guys have been clamoring over the last uh, few hours for him to get the release. But don't worry, uh, you can make your money back by heading over to the fastest and easiest way uh, to check out your sports betting needs. And of course, I'm talking about betonline.net. Whether you want to bet on preseason football, regular season football, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, golf, BetOnline is the place to be. It's your number one source for odds, lines, and games this year. So head on over to BetOnline today. Use your mobile device to sign up and learn more about the action happening today bet online where the game starts so alan and i are recording this tuesday evening a few hours after the falcons have officially cut down their roster down to 80 players uh they were cutting four players auden tate the wide receiver geronimo allison the other wide receiver they cut outside linebacker Quoney dang the undrafted free agent out of cal and a uh, pit legend, as I said, uh, cornerback Lafayette Pitts, who got flagged uh, for that uh, pass interference. Uh, How in, can you be a legend and not turn your head around in that scenario? That ball was in the air for like five seconds. I was literally counting. I was like. Oh. Yeah, uh, Pitts did that a lot at, at Pitt. He was a very frustrating cornerback during his collegiate days. Um, and to get the fifth move. The Falcons waived injured defensive lineman Jalen Dalton, who actually started the game in replacement for Grady Jarrett. Um, and that means that if he clears waivers, which 99.9% .9 chance he does, he will go on injured reserve uh, and be out for the season. And that's just another player that the Falcons have lost along the defensive line. You know, Vincent Taylor's out for the season. They already uh, lost an undrafted free agent in Bryce Rogers. Marlon Davidson's currently dealing with an injury, uh, and he's not expected to return at the preseason. Um, Alan, first I'll ask you your thoughts on these cuts. Were any of these surprises to you? And then I'll ask you sort of, do you, uh, are you on the, uh, sort of the official locked on Falcons slogan, feeling like the Falcons desperately need to add some D line help when the final cuts are, are made next week? Well, absolutely not. Cause I thought Jalen Dahl was one of the standouts. Like I like the way he was kind of taking on double teams. I thought him and Ogun Deji flashed the most when it came to, uh, run stopping and you know Dalton's had a really strong camp as well so I think him and Taquan Grant those are like the two interior tackles that I think have had really strong preseason to lose him like I didn't think it was a like it, it obviously hurts but like I didn't think it was going to change their judgment whether or not they should sign a defense tackle they absolutely need defensive tackle help it's pretty evident so it's unfortunate Dalton's out for a year but to me, they should be on the phone literally right now trying to see whether it's Danny Sheldon, Linval Joseph, whoever it may be, because uh, they can't. I just I don't know if Anthony Rush could handle 30, 35 snaps a game. I think he's better as a rotational piece. Uh, as for the rest of the cuts, I just think Tate barely saw the field. Allison had that big drop against Detroit and didn't do too much. So I thought it kind of makes sense. And you look at Kadero Hodge. Not just a special teams guy. I know special teams matters, of course, on his pockets, but they're all high just making plays. And uh, and uh, Jer Jared Berthardt, am I saying his name right? I, 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 I blanked out. There was at least four times last night. I thought his name was Corey, Courtney, Jake. I was like, what is his name? So he, he, he was great. So I think, look, as 
preseason goes on, some guys work their way up that echelon. I just think those two receivers in particular, even though they're not necessarily no names, they deserve to to compete for a roster spot. Regardless, you know, Allison known for his days in Green Bay and giving us great Twitter entertainment and Tate having that four week run in Cincinnati, this didn't improve enough. And you know, Pitts, he struggled. So I think the cuts are totally understandable. I didn't see uh, Dang too much either. So uh, I don't think any of these cuts were controversial. I just think it's a little unfortunate, you know, Dalton's out for a year uh, because he was having a really strong camp from all reports, and he definitely flashed all these two preseason games. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think Dalton probably is the most notable because of the concerns about the D-line dip that we already had. And, and now that those only get magnified a little bit. Not as if like, oh, suddenly, you know, he was going to be the linchpin piece that saved the Falcons defensive line. But given that you already were, or at least I was, already concerned about it, then it, it only just goes up a little bit. But, you know, people that have been listening to this podcast regularly for the last three months knows that basically since Brian Edwards was acquired via trade back in mid-May, that, you know, I, I felt like it was inevitable that Auden Tate and or Geronimo Allison were probably not going to make the roster. The question was going to be whether or not they played well enough to make the practice squad. It doesn't appear that's the case, although occasionally a team will use this initial cut um, to waive a player uh, and, and hopefully get them to pass through waivers only with the idea of when final cuts are made, they'll assign that player um, to uh, the practice squad, just given that it's going to be harder to get guys through waivers next week when the final cuts are made. Uh, I, I should use air quotes final because we know that there will be more roster moves made after August 30th. But uh, so we'll, we'll see if, you know, any one of these guys uh, could get snuck back onto the practice squad at a later date. I thought dang, just because he was getting a lot of work on special teams had a, a decent chance of, of being that guy, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But uh, you've already talked about a couple of players like Jared Bernhardt, or should I say Jake, or Courtney, whatever, whatever you were sitting. I don't know where Courtney name. came from. <laughs> Courtney Bernhardt. Okay, that's his new nickname. Um, but uh, any any players other than that, D. Alford, that have stood out to you that you're feeling like you know is making a strong push to make the roster or the practice squad so far this summer? I obviously mentioned uh, to Quan Graham, uh, Graham as well. Um, I wish I could highlight a linebacker. But I feel like the linebacker play has been. Either non-existent, underwhelming, I don't know the words, but no one's really stood out. I thought Troy Anderson had a couple of rough snaps, but look, he's a work in progress. You haven't seen too much from the safeties. Uh, when it comes to standouts, I, I, for some reason, every time I feel like the Falcons had a big run, Jermaine Fetty was responsible for it. I don't know why Jermaine Fetty, he's he's mauling people out there. Those second stringers don't want no, they don't want no smoke with Jermaine Fetty. But uh, I think Ferks are. Look good as a blocker. I know he made a couple of nice catches as well. You got him and Pruitt. Because we know one of these two are going to play a bit of a prominent role in the offense because we know how much they use 12 and 22 personnel. So uh, I think definitely monitor those two tight ends. I thought both of them had their moments last night. Even though Pruitt, it's like he had a miscue somewhere. I forget what exactly it was for. But uh, uh, as for other standouts, I just mentioned, I think Algier had a good game. Um it was weird not seeing Austin really out there. There was no real explanation for it because I thought Austin shined against Detroit. But uh, I don't know. It was, it was it, it, like it, everything started out so strong the first half, but then once that rain started coming down, it became a real muck bowl. Yep. Yep, it did. Yeah. Much to the chagrin of all the people visiting betonline.net. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, tight end position is interesting because like Parker Hesse. When they signed Michael Pruitt, I was like, oh, no, Parker Hesse's on cut watch. But, like, he basically started the game. He's He seems like he's settled into that Lee Smith role, at least based off of how he's been deployed uh, this summer, um, you know, as that guy that just comes in to block and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how many tight ends they keep because, you know, they have the incomparable Felipe Franks pulling double duty there. So we, we might see – you know, potentially five or six tight ends on, on this roster this upcoming yeah. season. And, and I don't think anybody should be surprised by that, given we know Arthur Smith loves his, some tight ends. Yeah. Five tight ends. Uh, somewhere Mike Malarkey's got to be in the building. Somewhere. Well, I remember that. I can't remember if it was like two, three years ago. There was that off season where like the Bears had like 11 tight ends on their. Oh, my. They they literally signed everyone inside. I think Chase Kaufman was like, oh, no, uh, not Chase Kaufman. Eric Sauber was like their ninth signing. You know, it was like Jimmy Graham, Adam Shaheen. It was like so many guys. Ben Bronicker. Yeah. 
for all we it's, know. It was everybody. Um, so, you know, Arthur Smith is channeling his inner Matt Nagy uh, by, or no, I guess that's Ryan Pace's influence. What, uh, what am I talking about? It's it's Ryan Pace, Pace bringing that Bears influence over here to Atlanta. Once again, just reason number 452 why Ryan Pace is secretly or not so secretly the actual GM of the Falcons. I'm curious, did you see anything stand out when it came to both the centers? I didn't really notice anything. I thought the Dolman handled pass protection relatively well, but I didn't really see much in the running game. No, you know, I'll give it another look when I, but rewatching the game to earlier today, it just was seemed there was no real difference between them watching Dolman on those early series and then Hennessy later on in the game. It feel like nobody really sort of solidified their grip on, on that roster spot. I mean, starting spot. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. I think because you have some of these battle, like we don't know what's going to happen at linebacker. We don't know what's going to happen at center. I feel like those joint practices is probably going to determine uh, who's going to start. Like, you know, we just don't have this information to real make a valid prediction on who's going to start. Like, we could say Dolman, we could say Walker and Evans at linebacker, but you know, who knows what these joint practices are doing. Like, I know the Jets are the joint practice champions, but we, we don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm eagerly anticipating what happens with these upcoming joint practices against the Jaguars, uh, you know, on Wednesday and Thursday. I'm sure many of you guys are already listening to it on Wednesday, this episode. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what narratives come out of that. Obviously, have you covered here on Locked on Falcons. But, Alan, I want to thank you uh, for joining me, sharing your insights into um, Kyle Pitts' hatred of you and uh, Courtney Bernhardt. Um, and his push to make the roster, you're, you're never going to live that one down, my friend. Oh, man. Is this um, the new Joey Mabu? <laughs> I have not thought of Joey Imbu in yeah, a long I time. I love the relationships with the Falcon players, but like now it's like Vic Beasley and Kyle Pitts. Man. Those are the only two that like really just just did not want to speak to me. Yeah. And John Abraham. I mean, I was on the beat until I was 12. I was a 19-year-old, reckless college kid i'm talking about a pro- real professional i heard a quick story i uh, was this eagles game 2016 i think beasley had a multi-sack game it was a classic big beasley multi-sack game you know those effort sacks that we all love and i just remember trying to go to his, his uh his lock because he usually got wait for him to get dressed i thought he was dressed he looked ready to go and he's like no i'm not ready yet you gotta wait and he said in a real authoritative voice and then he had to put his hat on Okay. Well, you know, he, he had that dog in him uh, when he was telling you to, to back away. So uh, don't ever let anybody tell you that, you know, Vic Beasley never asserted himself, uh, you know, when it came to the sport. But uh, Alan, go nothing. ahead. I got nothing. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead and plug, uh, you know, what you're working on, what you got coming up, what, what how, how you doing in your life. Uh, you can probably Alan Sturk, A L L E N S C R K. We are right now just at the top of playing what we're going to do for the season. I think I'm going to be doing some preview shows with Kevin Knight on the Falk Walk Live. I'm sure I'll be on this podcast quite a bit. I did actually a show earlier today uh, with Will McFadden. So I'm doing the rounds. I'm, I'm, it's that time of year. You got to be active. So um, nothing oracle wise at the moment. I do have something related coming out in September about just the Falcons offseason moves. It's already done. Um, it just has to get published. It's like some sponsored thing, but where it's just breaking down all the off-season moves and how it could you know, result in like long-term sustainable success. Because at this point, that's what the Falcons are. It's, it's a two-year, three-year process point. So besides that, also you know, I recommend it. I have to start doing this now because I realize you know I'm, I'm in this like, business mindset now. Uh, download the Odyssey app because I'm running this app, well, at least the sports side and a little bit of news. So definitely download that. You can find this illustrious podcast. You find 92.9 The Game and all sorts of stuff. I'm the one that's deciding on what podcasts are being promoted, what radio clips. So you best believe this podcast will be on the, what we call carousels, a.k.a. playlists. So uh, definitely download the Aussie app. You get all your coverage for sports, news, music, and entertainment. There you go. All right, guys. Uh, check out the ultimate pro football preview 2022 on the odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast uh check out locked on sports atlanta locked on braves locked on bulldogs locked on hawks with our guy Shout out Brad. Brad Bowen. there you go 
I knew you would appreciate a, a Brad Roland plug here, Alan, uh, at the end of the show. Obviously, tomorrow we'll be back to break down whatever happens in uh, that first joint practice with the Jaguars. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, we'll be talking about, you know, fights. Uh, and, and everybody knows Jarvis wants to see Troy Anderson out there scrapping with the various Jaguars uh, offensive linemen. So we'll no, see Jerry's that happen. <laughs> uh, so, guys, um, appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, always recommend another second listen for you. And why not make uh, the Locked On uh, podcast on this week where it's fantasy draft week. So go make Locked On Fantasy Football your second listen. You can also check out Locked On Dynasty Football as well. But on Locked On Fantasy Football, Vinny Iyer, the host of that, has over 20 years of NFL expertise and a unique angle to give you all the moves that no one else has uh, to help you win your fantasy football season. So get ready for fantasy draft with the Locked On Fantasy Football podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Guys, appreciate it. Till then.